Hello there, uh, my name is John Hess and welcome to the Chalk Valley Annual History Festival. Um, we're on the outskirts of Salisbury in Wiltshire in southern England and I'm delighted to be joined by the author Paul Lay. His book, Providence Lost, The Rise and Fall of Cromwell's Protectorate. A key and fascinating period of English history. We're talking about Charles I, um, mm -hmm. he lost his battle. Um, with Parliament, he lost his, his civil war, uh, he eventually lost his head as Indeed. well. Was it always inevitable that Oliver Cromwell um, should become England's ruler? Oh, not at all. Um, I think um, Cromwell is a very unlikely figure to have become England's ruler. Um, this is a man who, for the first two thirds of his life, um, barely exists in the records at all. A man who is one of the great cavalry commanders of British history, uh, didn't fight in battle until he was 43. Uh, so you can see that this is a figure who really is a very unlikely character to be there. You know, he's a figure from the lower gentry. He's probably the poorest MP in his intake. This is a man who has blood on his shirt because he can't shave properly. Um, a very, very unlikely figure to Record become... came from farming stock in the Fens? Farming stock, uh, Puritan farming stock. He appears to have had some kind of breakdown. Uh, I th I've always considered him probably to be something of a depressive. He's a man of great mood swings, I think, a man of violent utterances. So was he likeable? Well, I don't know. I mean, we can never really know. I mean, he's a man who's bold. He's ruthless, as any Irish person would tell you. But I think there's also a lot you can see from his relationship with his wife and his daughters, uh, which is very close, which is very profound. There's an emphasis on education, on female education, as there often is among Puritans. Um, so, He's a mass of contradictions, but perhaps what makes him so fascin fascinating really is that he's very evasive. Mm. One can't really know Cromwell, and so people tend to project their ideas onto him. So, for example, you know, he's a hero of the left to some extent because he's a Republican, or he's considered a Republican, although I think um, there are caveats about how Republican he actually is, but then he's also a hero of the right because he's a nationalist, he's an English exceptionalist, he's a great parliamentarian. So he, he's a man who's all things to all men. Or so he's, he's seen as a hero on either side of the political fence. So And a villain. Yeah, so is he, is he more, I mean, as a military man, is he more like a General Jaruzelski figure from Poland <laughs> or is he more a Che Guevara? Where, where, where would you go? Uh, well, yes, I mean, uh, whether uh, Jaruzelski, it's very, very difficult to think of a, um, to think of someone who is analogous. The person I think who's most analogous to it, I'm being a bit mischievous here, but I think you can afford it's to be. correct, <laughs> it's Margaret Thatcher. Oh. Uh, if you look at their shared characteristics, both are from Fenland, uh, both are not exactly keen on monarchy, but are hardly Republican, uh, great parliamentarians, both uh, belligerent, um, both have a difficulty with the Irish, both are really philo-Semitic. Uh, you know, Cromwell is the person who readmits Jews into Britain and uh, Margaret Thatcher had a very close relationship with, uh, with Jewish colleagues. Um, and I think also they both felt in the end that the country let them down, I think, <laughs> uh, in the sense that there's, there's a famous quote about Margaret Thatcher um, that she tried to create a country in the image of her father, Alderman Roberts, who was very much a Puritan figure, but she created one in the image of her son. And I think that's very similar to the way Cromwell tried to have this profoundly moral reformation and produce this godly place. And what did we end up with? The Merry Monarch. Yeah, but it, it strikes me that um, these days, when you mention Oliver Cromwell, people think, no, no, you've got that wrong. Don't you mean Thomas Cromwell? And, and we've seen this kind of mushrooming of coverage of Thomas Cromwell. Why is that? Why, why is it that Oliver Cromwell doesn't seem to get a good press? Uh, well, I mean, it's, it's whether he gets any press at all is the thing. I mean, obviously, you know, the Thomas Cromwell 
aspect is, is, is due to Hilary Mansell's great success, and I've got nothing wrong with her, but of course it, it feeds into this mania and obsession with the Tudors. So it's another figure who connects us to Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn and everything else. So there's a success. Incidentally, of course, um, the Cromwell name is inherited from Thomas Cromwell because his family worked for him and took his name. And it gives you some sense of just how Puritan they were because they kept that name even after Thomas Cromwell's fall. So that's, that's an aspect of that. But I think we have a problem with the 17th century uh, in general. I think the fundamental problem is that we no longer understand religion and Christianity in particular. As and fundamental. I'm, as as yeah. fundamental to the ideas and ambitions of the Cromwellian regime, concepts of providence, predestination, all that kind of stuff. And if you don't understand, or at least have some grasp of that, the period makes absolutely no sense well, at let, all. Well, let, let's touch on that, um, because obviously Oliver Cromwell means something very different to people uh, from, from Ireland. Uh, and I'm often reminded of the saying that the English don't know their history, which is their misfortune, but the Irish know theirs, and it's their tragedy. Yeah. So how, how do you explain Oliver Cromwell to an Irish audience? Uh, with great difficulty. Um, I compare Cromwell in Ireland uh, to the house of his in Ely, which bears his name, Cromwell's house. Uh, he had a connection with that house for about 20 years. He rarely inhabited it. But it's 800 years old, and so there's a great deal to say about that house, but it's seen only through the prism of Cromwell. The history of Anglo-Irish relationships and the hostility that's there is 800 years old. It goes back to the 13th century. And yet, we see it through the prism of a man who spent only nine months in it. And I think like a lot of things, not just in Ireland, but over here, uh, Cromwell is a kind of bogeyman. He is the figure we impose those ideas upon because it saves us from really addressing the issues of complexity, which of course uh, people like simplified history, they like myth, they like an easy answer, they like a hero, they like a villain. They don't see people in their full complexity. And I think Cromwell is a man of profound complexity uh, and contradictions, uh, as is his regime. And that's what's interesting about him to me. Uh, whereas on both sides of the Irish Sea, um, he is just a kind of cipher for whatever people wish to see him there. And of course, Ireland is a relatively young country, it's an ancient culture. The Republic of Ireland is only uh, a century old. And so someone has to register in those national myths, which by their nature, this is not unique to Ireland at all. All national myths are simplified in some sense. And, and Cromwell plays a major part in that young nation's um, founding myth. But, but what strikes me is that, I mean, I know you said about Chest Chesterton's mm. quote about the Irish mm. knowing their history, English not knowing it at all. Uh, Actually, what the book has revealed to me is that the Irish are actually just as ignorant of their history as, <laughs> as, as the British are. And that has come as a surprise, yeah. certainly of the mid 17th century. Well, I'll tell you what, one of the surprises from your book uh, in terms of things, I didn't know that. Turn another page, I didn't know that. Let's start, first of all, um, with, with the great adventure um, to take back um, basically what is Latin America from the Spanish and, and the Spanish West Indies. Um, this first early steps towards creating the British Empire and it was a disaster. Why? It was a disaster. Uh, you can blame it on hubris. It was very, very ill-prepared. I mean, I think the, the, the person who is responsible for that failure above all others is John Desborough. So let's, let's just to explain to, to, to our, our viewers. This was, in effect, uh, a task force that was sent out to take what is now um, the, the kind of Haiti, that, that area of yeah, the West it's, Indies. It's, it's, Hispaniola is the island that's now shared between Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Um, it's in the proximity of Cuba and Jamaica. 
Uh, it was taken for a very brief while by Francis Drake uh, during the Elizabethan period. But this attempt to take it from the Spaniards is really the first state-backed imperial enterprise in British history. Uh, before that, it had been done by privateers like Drake, like Raleigh, like Hawkins, that kind of uh, figure. And for once, it's given the backing of the state. But I think the state, by that point, had rather taken its eye off the prize. It didn't really listen as it should have done to Caribbean hands. There were people experienced in the Caribbean. Uh, Barbados had been settled there, but there was a lot of tension about Barbados because of because of tensions about royalism. It, it had become quite a strong royalist uh, stronghold, so there was a kind of suspicion about that. Um, but nevertheless, we talk about hubris, and I, I, I certainly think that's a problem with the enterprise. But there's no real reason why a well-funded, battle-hardened army and navy couldn't have taken Hispaniola. Mm. Uh, but we got Jamaica. But we got Jamaica. Well, yes, as very much an afterthought. <laughs> and, uh, but Jamaica proved to be very, very important. It's one of the great ironies, of course, that um, this place that became a, a charnel house of slavery, uh, appalling brutality, uh, was founded by men who preached the ideas of liberty in their own land. There's a great irony there. And no doubt they would have done exactly the same had they taken um, Hispaniola as well. Let, let, let's get on to, to, to the raw politics in this now. I mean, anyone who has kind of walked on their way to, to Westminster will see that very impressive statue of Oliver Cromwell uh, looking straight across the road to that tiny bust of his nemesis, Charles I. Um, why is Cromwell so fundamental to the development of parliamentary democracy as, as we know it now? Or isn't he? I think he is. Um, I, I, I think he is important. He is the person who stands up for parliament, at least in abstraction. I mean, I, I say about um, Cromwell that he's a parliamentarian, uh, a serial parliamentarian, I think his desire for the rule of Parliament is real, but the parliaments that he constructs, whether that's the bare bones parliament or his two uh, protectorate parliaments, always disappoint him. Yeah, but why, why did that happen? Because basically what, what happened, we had a military dictatorship with kind of regions run by the military. Ultimately, yeah. yeah. Um, I think, you know, it, the, the fundamental truth is that, is that whatever Cromwell's political ideas, the theology always overruled it. His number one master was not Parliament or the people or anyone else, it was God. And I think that's the real thing that I think the modern mind, modern sensibilities find difficult. And I think you look back, I mean, for example, you mentioned the statue. Uh, the statue was uh, funded in the end uh, by Lord Rosebery, a great liberal figure at the end of the 19th century. And Cromwell, and I think we see this in the Cromwell Association that's founded by Isaac Foote, another great liberal from, from the famous uh, political family, identify him at that point as a man who stands for Parliament against the incursions of the Crown. Uh, but it's a secularised version of the figure, and it's not at all an accurate one of the realities of the situation. But it is again another classic example of us imposing uh, the present. But you can onto understand this that, because no, people absolutely. like to kind of understand mm. um, and, and yeah. do like to draw parallels. The, the one parallel I'm, I'm interested to get your thoughts on is if people are wanting to understand you know, providence um, and what it was in the mindset of Cromwell and those English Puritans, um, surely the nearest we get to it now is an understanding of religious fundamentalism that we see uh, in parts of the world. Were they driven by a fundamental belief that God was on their side and that England was the elect? How did they have that mindset? Well, um, it's I mean, the 17th century world, I mean, it's what Keith Thomas, uh, you know, citing Keith Thomas, it hadn't yet had the disenchantment of the world, of secularisation. 
So the concept of providence is not unique to Cromwell. Uh, the royalists would have exactly those same beliefs. I think what's heightened among Calvinists in particular, and Puritans being the most kind of extreme uh, kind of that, although even within Puritanism there's a great, de or a great range of opinions and, and beliefs and fundamentals, um, is the idea of predestination. So predestination, fundamental belief to Calvinism, is that your fate, your eternal fate, has been decided before the creation of the world by God. So there is nothing you can do, as you can in Catholicism, where you can be good to people or you can carry out great acts of charity or whatever, that simply doesn't exist in Calvinism. Your fate has been decided. And all you're looking for are signs that you are part of that elect. Mm. And the most explicit way in which you can find the hand of God is victory on the battlefield. And that's where the Western design and failed. That's, isn't and that's it? where the Western design fails. And this leads to this breakdown mm. in Cromwell and no doubt among his followers. You know, what have we done wrong? And you have, I call it this mindset, a surveillance society of the soul. You are never allowed to rest from pondering what one's fate is. And the, the, kind of the major generals who were appointed basically the military to run the districts, yeah. they were given also that task, weren't they? Yes, I mean, they did it in, you know, again, we have this range of people. Some of them were pretty pragmatic in dealing with the local gentry families, the landed people who were the natural, seen as the natural rulers of these districts. So many people were pragmatic. There were people like Charles Worsley, the Major General, who literally drove himself into an early grave through his attempts at reformation. That was in the Cheshire, North Staffordshire, and Manchester, Lancashire area. Uh, so, you know, you, you again have a range of figures, um, none of whom are especially successful. You know, it's a very difficult thing. The, the English people, by and large, are not a very puritanical culture. Uh, you know, it's very difficult to close down racing or gambling or betting or pubs or whatever. Uh, and it's a thankless task. And when you try to do that, you take your eye off the ball of the things that people expect a government to deliver. But that, that's, that's many people's image of it of him, isn't it? He's seen as a killjoy, he's seen mm. as kind of dour, very earnest. Yeah. I didn't expect him to be indecisive, which is one of the themes well, in your uh, book. Militarily, he's not indecisive. He's incredibly bold. Politically, he is. Um, and I think that's because of this religious element of seeking. You know, it's very simple on a battlefield. You go out and you win. <laughs> it's a very <laughs> black and white together. thing. Uh, <laughs> dealing with a range of uh, of views, of people, of having beliefs and having to compromise, be pragmatic, is rather more difficult and rather more challenging. And that's true of any politician. Um, and I think that Cromwell is not, he has an authoritarian streak, but I don't think by nature he's especially authoritarian when it comes to politics. He's quite collegiate. Uh, he has a group of people around him, many of whom are family members, uh, literally with people like Henry Cromwell. Uh, but also, you know, brother-in-laws like John Desborough. I mean, I think when he dies, the commanders of the army are his brother-in-law, uh, his son rules Ireland. I mean, you know, the, it's a very, very small family group, which actually parallels a kind of dynasty. Well, let, is, let's go there. on to the end game, because one of the other things that surprised me um, was home was Hampton Court. Mm. So. Towards the end, there is the build-up towards how are we, uh, what, what sort of governance are we going to have? Mm. Um, there's the issue of the succession because he's not very well. Um, Richard, his son, is is lined up, which mm. kind of ends in tears as well. Um, but the, what surprises me is parliamentarians come to Oliver Cromwell, the Lord Protector, and say, "Will he be king?" Mm. And it strikes me um, that his decision to say, no, I'm not going to be king, because that's what the last nine years have all been about, surely, in the Civil War mm -hmm. and, and taking Charles I to the scaffold. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to be king. Um, 
And because he refuses, that basically is the end of that whole political experiment. Yeah, yeah, it is. It, it is really. I mean, we we can see from hindsight that that's the case now. Not necessarily apparent at the time, but uh, this is the theological element. You know, he's asking God. It takes him six weeks before he takes the decision to turn down the crown. Six weeks. And there's no doubt that he spent much of those six weeks in a dialogue with God. Do I take this crown? And he decides at the end that God got rid of that crown. It's not his to restore. I will not build Jericho again, is his famous phrase. It disappoints those around Lord Broyle, I suppose, the parliamentarians, the kinglings as they're known. Many, mainly a group of Irish uh, lords and parliamentarians. Um, and from then on, it unravels because the succession is not decided. So when Cromwell dies, on the 3rd of September 1658 in this great storm. John Thurlow, his spy master, reports that the succession should go to Richard, who has neither the support of the army That's nor the support of Parliament. That's his eldest son. We don't know whether that's true or not, because it's simply, is Thurlow, is that Thurlow's decision? Did Cromwell tell Thurlow that decision? Is it the decision that Thurlow thinks Parliament wants to hear? We don't know. There's no proof or any source that will tell us uh, whether that was Cromwell's decision rather than that of Thurlow or someone else. And Richard is plainly not up to the job. He's not a terrible failure, Richard, but he doesn't have the support of the army. And here's the key weakness. The protectorate regime depends from the beginning to the end on the support of the army. And the, the British people do not want ultimately military rule, particularly when they see the settlement begin to unravel again into what looks like another civil war. You have the religious sects out again it's all descending into madness and we were talking about Thomas Hobbes earlier who comes from this part of the world his idea of security this is the most important thing to the people Thomas Hobbes is a philosopher who is um, uh, very important by nature by disposition a royalist he is in fact a mathematics tutor to um, to the young Charles Stuart a future Charles II but he makes peace with the protectoral regime um, and writes his great work Leviathan which among many things stresses the importance of security and we may laugh at 17th century ideas or mock them perhaps of security and what people will give up but think what we have given up in the 21st century when we see a pandemic people will give up an awful lot if a government can promise security you know Religious liberty is one thing, and people were rather fearful of what things like religious liberty had actually un unleashed. And so after this terrible ordeal of civil war, the uncertainty, the fear of return to civil war or instability, uh, the failure of Cromwell's project to heal and settle the nation, you suddenly have this promise of security in the old form with the restoration of a monarch, Charles II, who's ready to go, rather attractive figure, as a young man uh, who seems to want to not be vindictive in the settlement and his return, and people buy into that. So and was it a shoe in really, towards the end? I think towards the end it was. Um, I don't think there was really an alternative. Again, these things aren't inevitable, yeah. but there was a there was profound logic to it, certainly. And you know, by and large, it worked. Okay, I'm I'm I'm, I'm going to ask you uh, what's next, really, because obviously, as as an editor of, of History Today, you must have lots of ideas crossing your desk. <laughs> um, but um, on this, you touched on sources. Is it an easy period to study? In terms of uh, sources. Uh, the biggest problem uh, with this period is there is so much. <laughs> right. It's not one where you have to uh, struggle 
to find information. This is a very well documented period. It is a great period, a kind of loggeria takes place of pamphlets and newsletters and books and all kinds of things which are all very accessible uh, so that is not a problem at all the the problem is principally when when writing about this period when uh, is one of a kind of editorial process it's what to leave out mm. uh, and to focus on the things that matter to construct uh, if one's writing narrative history to construct you know a narrative history so should tv channel controllers being should, should they put thomas cromwell to one side um, and look at oliver cromwell is it is it is it a banker for netflix uh i'd like to think so i mean f for me it's the absolutely crucial period in british history and european history it has profound global implications i mean one can argue that even the United States is a kind of counterfactual. The United States is the place where people like that won. It's where the Baptists, the Methodists, uh, the people, the, 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 the Puritans in particular won uh, in the United States. And we, we became the country where the Royalists won. Um, so if you want to see what Britain would have been like, it's quite useful to look at the United States and see um, a settlement that's based on the kind of ideas that came to the fore during the Civil Wars, during the Commonwealth, during the Protectorate. Lovely. Well, look, Paul's book, uh, Providence Lost, The Rise and Fall of Cromwell's Protectorate is out now. It's also in paperback. Paul Lay, thank you very much indeed. My pleasure, thank you.